And uh, there's still, of the 750 milliliter bottle, there's still probably 700 milliliters left in it. So there's only been a little bit taken out only of that. Only a little bit. Yeah, just, only a little just taken out. Just a baby out. amount. That's okay. Anyway, so let's get, speaking of Italian yeah. stuff. That's Perfect a segue. segue. Yeah. yeah. What do we have here? Because so this, this, this is another one that you're, you're, you guys are known for. Yeah. Uh, this is our Super Nero. Mm -hmm. um, this is 2017 vintage. Let's see. Super Nero. What can I say about it? Nerodavila. Yeah. Um, Nerodavila is not necessarily synonymous with Texas or anywhere in the U.S., um, but it has become synonymous with Comanche, Texas, of all things. Uh, Dr. Brennan and his wife, Trelise, went on a trip to Sicily years ago and fell in love with this wonderful table wine, um, which is a table wine there and just kind of run of the mill. And, yeah. And you run into to great um, premier luxury um Nerodavlas and and I don't say it right um Jen Beckman's gonna make fun of me for my <laughs> Texan slang on that um but I'm gonna call it Nerodavla uh it's one word in Texas it's mm -hmm. just one big long slang word um so but but, it, but so the second half actually is just pronounced Davila not yeah. D Avila yeah which yeah. most Texans Nero, would probably say it though actually most Nero Americans D will say it Avila. that's yeah. what I always hear um I've, I'm trying to remember. That I actually got scolded at Texan last year, I believe. And I was like, you know what? You're from Texas. This is what I say. <laughs> so um, they fell in love with this. And it, was, it became their quest. Little did they know, it also became the quest of, um, of Dukeman to bring in Nerodavla about the same time. And Dukeman, of course, makes a lot more sense because they are so heavily focused in Italian. They are. Uh, Nero is pretty much our only Italian here. Um, we've dabbled in Montepulciano. Um, we don't really work with any Italian whites. I wish we did, but we don't yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so they fell in love with it. They The first thing they did when they got off the plane was they called um, the nursery supplier and they said, we have to get this. And they said, well, good luck, because it's not certified through foundation plant services. Um, and so it became their quest to get this here. And um, lo and behold, ourselves and Dukeman both got it. And Dukeman, they're wonderful friends. Um, we love the Dukeman, Stan and Lisa, they're great. Um, they got it in the ground of it a day or so before we did. And so they are actually <laughs> so they the, the first ones yeah. to plant it. Um, they're doctors too, right? Yes, yes, doctors, all the doctors. I'm telling you, um, there's a ton of doctors that... Both of them are doctors, I think actually. both, yeah. Yeah. Um, they're a double hitter. We're just a doctor, and Trelise was a nurse. So we're just a doctor-nurse. We're not a doctor-doctor. Still, medical field. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's it's just kind of funny. You have, I mean, yeah. Anyway, and they all fall in love with wine. Yeah, um, we won't digress too we'll far get, down that rabbit hole. But we'll yeah, you have a lot of people, a lot of people from medical field that, that started wineries. But so we yeah. planted this, um, I would say it's roughly 14 years old. This went... Um, into the Newburgh Vineyard when it was established. And um, yeah, initially, uh, A, first and foremost, we love this wine. It's fabulous, it does really well for us. The whole reason behind planting it was that it, it grows in a, a very hot region in, in Italy. Um, it, and it maintains its acidity. And visiting with growers while they were there, they were like, yeah, no, we don't ever have to worry about acidity with this. It, it holds up 
and holds true the whole time. And so being in Texas and being very hot, that's kind of the desire is to not have to manipulate acidity. Yeah, because um, it, it is. I mean, a, if you it, have to, you, you have, have to. Yeah, you have to, you have to. And that's one of the things about. In every what, region has yeah, to. Yeah, that's one of the things about Texas wines is that um, a lot of times there's um, there's there are issues with acidity and acid dropping because we get so hot and things ripen really quickly and as you ripen it things you know acid drops mm -hmm. so but yeah um yeah Such a good having thing. having grapes that retain mm -hmm. acidity means you have one less thing to worry about when one it, less in yeah. the winery yeah so um so we planted this uh we made our first vintage in 2010 and it was originally called Dark Horse. Um, oh, we made yeah. it for about two years. And Dr. Brennan, I'm relaying his stories. He got an email from a customer one day. And it had a picture in it. And it said, like, this isn't your wine, is it? And lo and behold, it was the other Dark Horse. The Dark Horse you actually probably know. Um, and probably about, no, oh, I'd say two months later, a, a letter followed a letter in the came. mail that said, um, please stop calling your wine dark horse. Um, we had filed the same year and, and both had equal rights to it. But we said, you know, those, those brothers, that E and J guy, like, yeah, they probably have better lawyers than we do. So <laughs> we'll, we'll just rename. Um, and it came to be that, uh, Todd Webster, our winemaker at the time, his daughter always heard him talking about Nero, 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 um, and associated it with a hero. Um, and so if you, ah. if you look at the label, um, we have I super Nero, which kind of falls in line with the super Tuscan, um, of sorts, but right. super Nero. Um, and so he is a superhero and he's kind of like opening his, his, I probably knew that. Grapes. I, yeah. Yeah. He's got on his super great, super outfit. great. So, um, it's one of our fun 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 labels um and i enjoy it we don't do a lot of comic wordplay or anything like that but it's a fun label um and so super nero for us um 2017 is actually the first year that it was not varietally specific to nero this has a little bit of tempranillo blended in with it um reason being um we're battling some fungal trunk disease in this also okay um and Nero is known, and it was actually why it was so hard to get into the U.S., it's known for having red blotch issues. Red blotch is not our situation with it, um, but yields have kind of dropped a little bit. Um, it's also extremely sensitive to frost. So if we mm. get any bit of a frost event, it, weirdly enough, wakes up earlier than all of our white wines. We've got one specific plant that we can say, all right, the year's about to get started. So it breaks by the earliest in the vineyard, um, which makes it the most sensitive in the vineyard uh, for Texas. So okay. while it can retain acidity, it's also at major risk for any frost event, um, which is also part of decreasing yields and things like that. Those those take a toll on on vines. So does that also mean, and, and, and I'm, mm -hmm. I, I might be asking a question you no. don't know the answer to, no. does that mean that, um, you probably know the answer, um, so if it buds early, is it also one of your first things you harvest? It actually or is it, has or is it have a really long, a little longer span. Okay. Um, Simeon historically is our earliest to harvest. Mm -hmm. We usually bring in Simeon and Viognier and then Naradabola. This yeah. year, it actually ran a little bit later. We, um, it's kind of a weird. 2020 is just weird. That's the theme of my discussion today. Is 2020 is just strange. Um, it was one of our later things to come in this year. Uh, the past two years, Tempranillo has been early to harvest, which okay. is strange. Um, so we're kind of maybe going through something climatically that's a little different, and we're seeing some changes in the vineyard. So Tempranillo, for, for, is it you or is it in Texas it, it's not an early harvester? Because um, I know that that's kind of thinking. Historically, it was not an early harvester, but yeah. his for the last two years in Texas, it has been an early harvester, and it's not just us. Because I know on the name, I guess in Spain, it tends to be an early harvest. Yes. And that's why yeah. it's called Tempranillo, yes. or that's late the theory. Breaking, late breaking, but early harvesting. Yeah. Um, so a short ripening time. Um, but Super Nero hung on for a long time for us. And so actually this year, again, it was a weird year. Our very first day of harvest, our harvester broke down. <sighs> 
we had to procure a new harvester from um, Oregon, or actually Washington State. It came, and um, so we were literally in the middle of a Viognier row. If you drive by Newburgh, our neighbors were here yesterday, and they said, um, so when is that going to, like, how does that get out of the vineyard? And we're like, yes, we know. It's broken down in the middle of a row. Yeah. Um, but so we actually got to upgrade from a 1992 broad mechanical harvester uh, to a wonderful, fancy, new, I believe it's a 2016 model um, Gregor G6. Um, and so it's got the onboard distemming and all sorts of wonderful stuff. It's great. And we don't, it has air conditioning. We don't know what to do with ourselves. So it's not like flying in a G6, but it's like harvesting yeah, with a G6. But it is harvesting in a G6. Harvesting um, with a G6. That is correct. So it magically made its way here in about four days. Um, wow. I, I pulled but into the vineyard. But not on G6. Yeah, I was, I was running out to the vineyard to, um, take some photos. And as I was pulling in, my husband called me and I was like, that's a problem. Like, why is, why, why is he on his phone? He should be on the harvester. And he's like, big, big problem, big yeah. problem. So, um, anyways, long story. Uh, we got a, a good life out of old blue, but old blue is, is toast mm -hmm. right now. And toast, she's kind of like, she's kind of like the Cadillac ranch in the middle of Newburgh vineyard. So, okay. So she's she's just broken down right there right. in the middle, but it's okay. Um, oh, this wine is really cool. Yeah, no, I like a, it a lot. It's a fun wine. It's very rustic. It's got these um, coffee earthen mm -hmm. notes to it. Um, the 2012 was the first vintage that I dealt with at Brennan Vineyards when I started, um, and it's still one of my favorite drinking wines that we have. Um, but as far as the the flavor profile, this leans more on the earth and rustic side uh there's still a lot of fruit on it but not near as much as you're going to taste in some of the other wines okay um, and i think that's something that's interesting about texas is you've got this like people associate texas wines as maybe sweet sometimes but i think a lot of it is the misconception of understanding fruit yes and sweetness it happens all and the fruit time. is sweet right yeah um i will never forget and i'm going to tell you a story um my very, 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 very first trade tasting for Brennan Vineyards was at Smith & Lonsky in Houston. Okay. We had just signed on with RNDC and they were doing their Taste of Texas roundup. And I got to take, it was my favorite wine at the time. It was our 2012 Lily. Uh, Lily, which we mentioned earlier, is a white roan blend. Um, it's eventually moved into being pretty much exclusively Roussan with a little bit of Malvasia Bianca blended in. Yes, I said Malvasia Bianca. That's a, it's a strange one that we've got in Texas too, but it's wonderful. Um, and this woman was tasting, and she came by and you could tell she wasn't really interested in tasting Texas. That's something we deal with a lot. Um, and she said, she smelled it, I'll never forget her. She smelled it and she poured it out and she said, I can't drink this, it's too sweet. And I was like, Hmm. Okay. Well, it's zero percent RS, and it's and it's not sweet, and um, and and fruit, while it can be very deceptive on the nose, doesn't indicate sweetness for a wine. Um, and so it it was a really frustrating moment for me entering the industry, and I was like, this has got to change, like the ability of somebody to say this is sweet off of a nose because let's talk about napa cab yeah right mm -hmm. like you wouldn't ever do that to napa cab like right. that was just shotgunning it for texas um and so uh, that was kind of um that was kind of a moment a pivotal moment for me early in my career to say like texas needs help and it needs individuals that are out there learning texas promoting texas and doing great things in Texas. And that's what I've done with my career. Yeah. So, um, I'll never forget John Bratcher, um, said to me and maybe not as polite terms. He said, you know, you can, you can lead a horse to culture, but you can't make her drink. <laughs> you know, so. yeah. Makes sense. There you I go. get it. So I, res I respect that. And I remind myself of that probably about twice a year. Um, but the, uh, the climate with Texas wines at things like Texom and things like that has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all largely in part due to um, wine professionals like James Tidwell and Drew Hendricks and Jason Heisaw Absolutely. getting out there and putting Texas on the stage and saying like, this is a legit place we've got to talk about. 
Um, and there's great things happening here. Mm -hmm. So, so it's definitely, um, if you haven't tried Texas, I'm going to campaign and say you should. You should. Absolutely. Great wines for the value also. So, so we will, um, abandon Super Nero and we'll move on to some of the bigger, heavier reds. Okay. Um, we've got our reserve Cabernet over there. And this is a fun year for reserves at Brennan. We don't always have reserves available. Like I said, we we go. take a lot of pride in reserve wines. Um, so we don't make these every year. There's there's a lot of years that we just put out our classic label wines, um, but it's really got to be indicative. And so this is 2017 Newburgh Vineyard Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. And I will, another pivotal moment, I'm gonna tell all the stories. For, for me and my career here at Brennan, was bringing a fellow grower in Texas, one who you know and I will not name. Um, they were buying some Morved from us. It was 2015 and we had tons of fruit. And another common conversation in Texas is cab, cab is not for Texas. It's too hard to grow, it's too much work. And, and that's what the early guys did. They planted Chardonnay and cab and, and they really did a disservice to Texas by doing so. I'm gonna disagree. Um, we have a wonderful microclimate to plant cabin. It's one of our most well-behaved wines. And sure, you might get bored when you go to a tasting and you want to hear about all these new fun things that Texas is doing, but cab's legit in Texas. Um, you have the right location and it's farmed the right way with the right mm-hmm. hands on it every day. It's a fantastic wine and any wine can be goofy in Texas, but um, this is a, is a great one. So this is 2017. Um, lo and behold, I will tell you, I don't remember a lot about 2017 because that was the year that my first child was born yeah. <laughs> in the middle of harvest. So I will tell you that I have two harvest babies. And um, True that, right. Cause yeah, they had about, the same due mm-hmm. date. So, well, um, and, and Astrid, um, she came a little bit early. She was late July, um, okay. but it was an early harvest. So we wouldn't normally be harvesting in late July, but um, right. we were. So. We normally start harvest, um, funny enough, it's crazy how we have these benchmarks. We usually start harvest the week of Texom. So, yeah. so second week of August. Um, and uh, my son Barrett was born August 9th of 2017. And Astrid was born July 28th. And this was an early year. So she was right in the middle of harvest, pre-harvest babies. So. Yeah, because you only came back what, a couple weeks ago uh, to work or last week? Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday, yeah. yeah. So I've been here for three Officially days. Officially back yes. here. I've been I mean, here for three days. you were on the call with us. I was on ago. the call yeah. because harvest got pretty wild and woolly, and they were like, "Please help us." Yeah. I said, "Okay, I'm coming. I, I can do the virtual tasting from my house. It's not like coming yeah. up here and having to dry your hair and look like a normal human." So, <laughs> um, so yes. Uh, and but was in Astrid made an appearance, right? Yeah. Astrid made an appearance. Yeah. She was on. She did her first Texas wine work. See, there you go preaching right. the gospel so um but this is a really beautiful wine this is Newburgh vineyards cabernet sauvignon okay. um i don't think i ever finished that story about the other grower uh that came to oh, buy yeah. more bed in 2015 and they're huge proponents that cab may not be the right grape for texas um but i knew he was going to make a proposition on it when we walked through the vineyard and he was like i'd really how do i get some of that and it's like not for sale you, you know, know, and and I I understand where yeah. they're coming from with that because, you know, the early days of the industry, mm-hmm. it was, and this has been kind of repeated the last couple oh, of interviews, yeah. that people wanted what was familiar, mm-hmm. and you know we have a lot of grapes that Texas does really well yeah. with. We 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 now know mm-hmm. they do well with. Um, at the same time, yeah, Tempranillo I, can grow anywhere. Yeah, right. Like at the same time, I've had some really 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 good cabs from texas and it's not that you can't do it it's just that maybe you might not want to work that hard well yeah and and maybe maybe the area that the cab was in maybe it wasn't the best area but there are areas and there are wineries that are or vineyards that do excellent you Mm -hmm. know and i've I've had some really legit cabs in my previous life i 
had a from a from a different winery. Mm-hmm. I had a cab that was a was a vineyard specific cab out of the High Plains. And oh, tell me which one it was. I just want to know. Canada Family. Oh, yeah. And I Back was there. like, I would I would mm-hmm. put that up against anything from Napa. Yeah. For the same price point. Yeah. I think we sold for 120 bucks on a restaurant list. So Beautiful. it's like a, it would be. I don't I don't know how much the the winery sells it for, but it, it should be in the 40 to 60 or 70 range, probably mm-hmm. 40 to 60 range. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, if I had somebody at the restaurant that would take the chance, I was like, look, if you yeah. don't like it, we'll get you something else. Yeah. Like, and we'll but drink it. Catch, catch your <laughs> Just, it'll go to a good home. Yeah. I'll we'll get the staff to drink home. it. And yeah. then, uh, yeah, I'll get the and staff. And I get to, to teach it. people about yeah. Texas. But uh, yeah. And, and anytime I got someone to con- convince them on not just any, not just that one, but any Texas mm-hmm. wine, they always enjoyed it. I never had someone send back the bottle. Yeah. If I got them to try Texas wine at the restaurant. Yeah. But yeah, that particular one. Yeah, I was like, I like this one a lot. Right. So yeah. I I I've never really completely drank the Kool-Aid. You can't have that in Texas. Right. But I now understand better that some some people do better than yeah. others with it and, and there may be some better sites and yeah, maybe people don't want to deal with it. I mean, Texans are ferocious people. Like, don't tell us there's something that we can't do because mm-hmm. we'll find a way to do it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, we have, um, even as far up in uh, Canyon, you have people growing Pinot Noir. Um, tricky? Hard? Is it a lot of work? You bet yeah, your sure bottom it is. it is. But, um, you know, it can be done. And where there's a will, there's a way. Um, so, I mean, even as you get into things like Pinot Noir, like it may not be what I drink. Because right. I don't drink it from any region. I'll just, I'll throw that out there. It's okay, don't worry about it. I appreciate it. I love it. I think it's great. It's just not my go-to. Um, but I live in Texas and we, we eat big, heavy things. Right. and. Um, we're meat lovers and barbecue lovers and Pinot Noir wouldn't be my go-to for that. So, um, that's just not what we do. But, uh, but this cab I'm particularly pleased with. It's delicious. It's fruity. It's, Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've connotated it to, it's, it's our Napa cab. Like this is, that is what this bottling is. So, um, it's funny to taste the 2017 classic. It's very Bordelais in nature. Um, so interesting to, to have that connotation happening. So, um, well, we'll move on to the Graciano cause it's starting to get busy around here. Right. Yeah. And, and you may go, get going some for a while, side so. And we are down to, well, that camera's working. We're down to two cameras now. We've got, and just two wines. So we're and perfect two wines, timing. Yeah. My, my camera has actually, um, I guess the out. battery, I guess the, um, so two things have happened with that camera. Either the battery, which is not the battery, so it may have actually run out of um, um, juice. The uh, I mean, I mean, I have enough more. I mean, I have enough room on the on the SD card. <laughs> okay. I will give this back. Well, I All am right. known to be long-winded, so hey, it very so well could be me talking. That's okay. Like, like I told you, Rebecca, I have nowhere to go. So I, I'm just driving home after this. So <laughs> this is such a weird bottling. So which one is this? This the is Graciano. Graciano. And I don't 2018. Get to, I go, you know, I don't get to do Graciano. First of all, on its own Graciano zone. Weird. And, yeah. yeah. Um, we just had a, a little PR. Ron's going to be jealous because he, he doesn't have enough Graciano to make a Graciano zone. I know. Yeah. Okay. We share some Graciano. So Ron okay. and I are buddy-buddy on the Graciano. <laughs> um, so we came on, or well, I say we. I came on in 2013, and in 2014, we looked at expanding our production heavily um mostly due to the fact that we had been wiped out by early spring freeze two years in a row and we mm-hmm. had no no wine to make wine with right um which we'll get to on the next wine um so we took on a bunch of high plains contracts that year um i came from the high plains had very close relationships with growers when i when i moved down here and um, and they were the people that put me through school. Um, okay. So I'm going to bring this to a full circle moment. I owe much of my career to Neil and Janice Newsom, and anybody that ever attended Newsom Great Day. Um, they brought me a scholarship every year in San Antonio Livestock Association. And there's a huge movement to educate um, the younger generation and bring them into Texas wine. And I can tell you, um, Neil and Janice, they are amazing people. I, got, I actually got to stay at the B&B last year, yeah, hung out yeah. with them every They're day. Wonderful humans. So, yeah, I, they have a special 
place in my heart, mm -hmm. you know, because of that. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and they're pioneers of Texas wine. Absolutely. Um, but so when I arrived here, we took on some, some grape contracts and we already had some established ones up there, but we were looking to diversify the portfolio. And um, funny enough, and this is super embarrassing at, at this juncture in life, Todd and I uh, picked up Graciano with the intentions of it being a blender for Neradabla. Mm -hmm. Because you hear the word Graciano, right? And it sounds Italian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had never actually done our research on Graciano to know that it was Spanish in origin. Um, <clears throat> and so we didn't know those things. And um, lo and behold, the High Plains has had its hellbent years of not getting any fruit. Um, and so 2018 was actually the first vintage of Graciano that we got after contracting this in 2014. Okay. Brutal. Wow. So on a five-year contract, we got like a year's <laughs> worth of fruit. Um, and so it was in barrel and actually Jen McInnes had stopped through here. She had never been to Brennan Vineyards and underneath where we are sitting is our barrel cave. Okay. Um, so we have a essentially um, 3,000 square foot barrel cave downstairs. And Todd said, you know, what the hell? Like, let's just open up a Graciano barrel and see what it's like. And we all tasted it. And I was like, are you sure this isn't Tanat? Like, what is yeah, this? Yeah, it is tannic. Holy but smokes. But it's great tannic. And how ironic to be tasting it with the Tanat people. <laughs> right, yeah. So if you didn't know, uh, Je uh, Jennifer McGinnis is um, from Bending Branch, who I interviewed. Mm -hmm. I interviewed Dr. Bob. Yep. Another doctor. Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob. Uh, he and I had a great conversation last year. Um, but yeah, and Jen Jen was the person who, who set it up for me, and I've known her yeah. the since, first her, time, since her newspaper days. I've known her. Yeah, and the first time I ever met Jen was the first time I met you mm -hmm. at Martin's, and we did a Texas fine wine tasting there. Yeah. And uh, she was still at the San Antonio Express. So. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Um, but uh, this was our first time tasting this, and uh, Jen was here, and we were all kind of quiet, and we all kind of were like, oh, this is really good. Um, and I think it had only been in barrel for maybe like a month, which, you know, at that point you're like, right yeah. I'm just throwing something at the wall. Who cares to even taste this, but we're going to taste it. And um, I think Jen looked at Todd, and she looked at me, and she was like, if you don't bottle that by itself, Right. I don't know what you're thinking. So we brought this to bottle. Um, I had kind of forgotten about that portion of it until, let's see, it was probably February. We were doing some blending. We were actually working on the W blend and um, we were tasting it. And I was like, shut the front door. This is going in a bottle by itself. Um, and so lo and behold, we had not filed for a cola. We had not done anything. Um, we had no intentions of making this wine. And um, within about three weeks, we were able to turn it into a bottling. Um, so is that, so that, so for the label approval, mm -hmm. um, that's what a cola is. Yeah. Um, was that, is that a short turnaround? Is that a normal turnaround? Because I don't, you never know. it doesn't seem like it takes, it seems like it takes forever from what everyone says. You never know. It depends okay. on if there's a government shutdown or. Ooh, that too, yeah. <laughs> or if it's the holidays or, I mean, you just never know. I've had colas this year that we have filed that came in within less than 24 hours. And I've been like, okay. oh, cool. I know that, I know You're that sometimes. You're over there. <laughs> yeah. I know that sometimes what, uh, in, somewhat inside baseball, but. Uh, and you'll know way more about this than I do, but how I understand it is sometimes uh, it's really quick, especially if it's just yeah. a minor change. Right. But when it's like a like a major a change or, or a brand new label, yeah. it can take a while. Yeah. Yeah. No, I Graciano is probably like a, a one week, seven to ten days turnaround. Um, okay. That's seven to fourteen days. I would say is pretty average. Like we don't ever expect to hear back from them like pronto. Um, but we did have labels this year that went through approval that we were like. You know, we probably should have worded that different. There's no way in heck they will ever approve that. And they came in within like less than 24 hours. Okay. So, and is it a little more automated now than it maybe it was a few no, years ago? It's, it's not it's meant still, automated, but maybe they're streamlined? Uh, streamlined maybe, but okay. it, it's still, there's still a human on the other end sitting there reviewing right. and making sure you checked all the boxes. So it, as far as automation goes, no. Yeah, um, but maybe, maybe they're be more efficient yeah. with their... Probably my big um, bone to pick with um, the TTB and the COLA process this year is that they changed the spelling for Sinso. 
Really? Um, and it sounds like some salt. Like it's very strange. Like is it? it is it? It's, it's very weird. It's, it, it's, they it's change not it to traditional. S A S A U L T or um, no, or S A S A L T. C I N C I N S. They removed the L. Really? They removed the L. I was trying to. I had to go back. I have a so very photograph. So C I N S A U T. Yeah, since so. It's it's literally spelt wow. as it speaks, and I'm no, like, no you guys are missing an L. I'm like, yeah. hello. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so so All they right. have changed that this year. So you will see that coming up on labels and be like. Don't blame the producer because it's it's all the TTB, which is well, I very think strange. They're, I think they're finally allowing you to use Dura for Petite Syrah. Yes, they are. Yes. Okay. Um, we we got off track, but hole. sorry, <laughs> yeah. that's what happens at the second to last wine. This is so. This is what it's like for two wine people just to yeah. just talk. Yeah. Which is what most wine reviews turn into anyway. It happens. <laughs> um, but so this is a super fun wine. Ron Yates is probably the only other person I know that ever made Graciano, along with um, Jim Johnson, who had Alamosa Cellars, which mm -hmm. was, was an early Texas winery um, down the road in Bend. Um, he was one of the... Less than they are retired now, and congratulations. That was one of the early places I went to, and mm -hmm. he was, I think... I think he was the very first winery I went to where I got mm -hmm. taken into the barrel room and he gave me yeah. a barrel sample. He yeah. blinded me on it. He's wonderful. Because yeah. I was like, oh, you're he, not, not, in a, not in a mean way, but you're the psalm, right? I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> try this. I was like, uh, now I'm under pressure to mm -hmm. identify a wine. I, 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 I think it was Tempranillo he gave me, but yeah. I, and I didn't identify. Well, I, he, I didn't know what it was. Um, they sold their winery, I would say it's probably been like 18 months, two years ago. Yeah. Um, and I will tell you, like, one of the most immaculate vineyards in Texas. And um, I know Ron Yates has purchased fruit from them several times. Yeah. Tio Pancho uh, was the name of the vineyard itself. Um, and they came up They came up in yesterday's interview, yeah, too. Yeah, but between them... Um, Ron and Jim Johnson and us, I don't know anybody that's taken a Graciano right. on the label to market. So um, for us, this was just too wonderful of a wine to pass up. Um, I mean, if you're a ribeye eater, this is ribeyes and short ribs. Like, this is your wine. So this is, you know, tons of black fruit, mm -hmm. great tan structure. So, yeah, ribeyes, roasts. You know, short ribs. I'm kind you know, of scared with, to talk because I have no idea what my teeth look like. At um, this point. You know, anything you know, anything that's got a lot of richness to it, a lot of fat to it. Um, I'm not a ribeye eater because I actually don't like the the nice way to put it is well marbled meat. Uh -huh. um, I like the leanest meats okay. available. I love I love you filet. and I have other things to talk about. Yeah, I love filet mignon mm -hmm. and all that, but but at the same time, you know. I'm not averse to it necessarily. Mm -hmm. I mean, but uh, I came from a sirloin family, and I yeah. married into a ribeye family, oh. and so yeah, I have a really hard time with with the meat. Although, although I love all the meat, but New I York grew strips? up in a sirloin family, New York strip family, fillet family. Yeah, New York um, strips—that that's the best of both worlds. Yeah, because you still have the the. And the, I married the, the ribeye eater, so yeah. it's it's kind of so. Then you just you know it's warfare. Order. It's beef warfare at our house, so. Yeah. You never know. You order porterhouses, and yeah. then you take the filet exactly. side. He takes the... T-bones kind of make a happy marriage, yeah. but, you know. If you didn't know that, T-bones, yeah. porterhouses, mm -hmm. it's the best yeah. of both worlds. You get basically the two major styles of steak. Yeah. Kind of. It's, it's, a, strip side. it's a strip side, right? Yeah, and the filet mm -hmm. side, not yeah. the ribeye side. We, anyway. argue, we argue about who gets what side, but it's okay. Yeah, it exactly. should be the best of both worlds. So. Exactly. So, All right, so... I plugged in. I plugged in the phone just because on my app here I can see the battery is starting to die a little bit, but it's not completely dead. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be in the middle of something, and then important, yeah, and Can't then yeah, out. and then like you came all the way. Rebecca, you have to Nancy. repeat it. Yeah. you have to repeat it. You know. Um, so we are in the last one. This is a, the you said the the, the w, w the W. Uh, all right. So W yeah. has many facets at Brennan Vineyards. Uh, there was the day and age where people wondered if it was perhaps a tribute to the George W. To W, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I mean, we are in Texas. That would yeah. make sense. You never a know. A tribute to the winemaker, and then our winemaker's name, Todd Webster. His name True also that, starts yeah. with a W. So 
So you never know. Um, it depends on who's pouring the wine to tell you and the story. And it says, it says winemaker's choice. That yeah. could be the W. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Very true. Right. So um, like we've mentioned before, 2013 and 14 were brutal, brutal years in terms of evaluating vintages in Texas, mostly because they don't exist. Um, Todd was at a uh, friend's house, and I say a friend, Dr. Russell Kane, in the Hill Country, and they were discussing all these hardships. But Russell's not a winemaker. Russell's not a winemaker. But He's he a horticulturist, <laughs> and he is a master gardener, which I find fascinating, and one day we're going to be best friends. Um, Russell's cool. I like. I So Russell, Russell and Jeff Cope are, they are, I think, the... <clears throat> Two of the first people I met mm -hmm. on kind of my side of things, right. on, on the media side. And if I remember correctly, I met them at a Saturday tech som session that mm -hmm. was talking about social media. They don't really do that anymore. It was like the one year they did it. Yeah. And that's also where I also met Jer Jeremy Parsi because he he did the Very he cool. did the he did the seminar on that. So uh, the tech som is how I've met a lot of people in the industry. And granted, there's more on, on Rebecca's side of, of things, but also knowing this, finding people that are in the media side, social media side, um, has been great. So yeah, Russell Kane, Jeff Cope, mm -hmm. Jeremy Parson, uh, who's been on the show. Yeah. Uh, he he was he joined me with uh, at a restaurant in San Antonio because he was he was consulting with uh, the list there. So mm -hmm. I interviewed the owner of that restaurant, which uh, if you ever go there is Luce and mm -hmm. uh, Joe Bonacontri awesome guy he treats us like family because well we're we're all italians so yeah anyway a little digression there but yeah well, give um, russell some props there yeah. yeah so this is a wine that um he really had a huge hand in making um and we were just in this state of what do you do with yourself so you've had two years of, of no fruit and you're in the wine business and you got to make wine like what do you do mm -hmm. um and he kind of prompted Todd and said, well, like, why do you have to follow any rules? True. And, well, because Dr. Brennan said so, and because everybody else says so, like, you got to follow rules, right? Well, no, you don't. Um, and so we, Winemaker's Choice was conceived from two bad hardship vintages. Um, and so it's non-vintage and it's multi-varietal, which is wild. Um, and so... What do you do when you need to make wine and you have no fresh fruit or anything like that? You, well, you go to the cellar and you find the best of the best and you blend it and you make a great non-vintage wine. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, I think it's an interesting um, approach because non-vintage has always kind of had a, like a day class A error about it. Like, oh, this doesn't have a vintage. Mm -hmm. Well, this is intentional. Um, we specifically spend probably, I would say two months of the year blending this wine. Uh, he, tough job, tough job. Goes through every barrel in the cellar, tastes it, marks it, has good, bad, ugly, and um, makes his selections to make W with. And so W gets the best of the best barrels, and we go through a really long blending trial on this. It's it sounds fun, but it's not red wine for breakfast. Not my thing. It's um, not. It's not. When, yeah. Whenever I. And when we start provide, providing Perini Ranch uh, beef tenderloin with our breakfast tastings, I'll be okay with it. But we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I I get that too. Like you know, I I taste wine mm -hmm. a lot, and and I tend to do long sessions. I'll record multiple episodes in one sitting mm -hmm. with, with winery and I'll show people, so yeah, I did 20 wines last night, 20 wines. How are you still standing? Oh, yeah. cause I spit and it's fun. Mm -hmm. But at the, at the, at the end of the session, yeah, you're, I mean, it, you're still absorbing. You're, alcohol, you're, right? you're doing, I'm, I'm, for me, I'm about five. I've probably sat in that chair for five or six hours. Mm -hmm. If I've done 20 wines, it's probably like a five hour session yeah. under the lights, not, not hot or anything, but it's just yeah. bright lights in bright your eyes. Lights. I'm, and, I'm getting there right now. Yeah, and it's like it's 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 a marathon, mm -hmm. you know. And even though you're spitting the whole time, it yeah, it's not fun yeah. to spend hours and hours. And tasting. then to sit down and do work the rest of the day, you're like, <sighs> yeah, I don't want to. You be will here. get a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you're gonna, you're absorbing it. Yeah. You're doing that much. You're For gonna sure. get a little bit of a buzz. For Maybe sure. Maybe not buzz buzz, but you'll you'll, yeah. you'll feel you're it. You're still you're still getting some alcohol yeah. in your system. Um, but so this is uh, volume five. Um, volume five. 
up there on my favorite list of volumes. Um, so we record this in volumes. Um, we didn't really think about that with the first year. Mm -hmm. First year came out and we were like, how are people going to know the difference between like this bottling and the next bottling? Okay. Well, so it's going to have to be a library. It's going to be in volumes. Um, so there's another wine that does that and they call it Voyage. Mm -hmm. Yep. And yeah, it's a non-vintage wine, and I think they're on Voyage mm -hmm. Seven right now yeah. is their, their current release. But yeah, and non-vintage is typically regarded as like Wah, yuck, like it doesn't There's have a vintage good ones on out it, there, right? But this is an intentional non-vintage. Yeah. This is a artistry, a craft maker, a um, a real art for blending, mm -hmm. um, and so kind of. You know, let's let's call it prisoner back in the day. Yeah. Um, this is is the prisoner approach to wine. Um, so we make this every year. Uh, it is available in distribution for locations like ste steakhouses and and things like that. But it has really become pretty much our own wine. Really? wine. Okay. Um, and it is um, it's our premier wine. It's our most expensive. It takes us the longest to make. It sees the most barrel age. Okay. Um, we've had years that it's had a little bit of white wine blended in it for stability. Um, Yes, that's kind of kind of funny how white wine does color stabilization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super weird. Um, but uh, it's one of our premier wines, and and now that we've kind of developed uh, some of our our red reserve programs, you're seeing a few more slip into that category. But this is the big dog at Brennan Vineyards. Okay, um, and it's so it's just whatever at the time so it could be it's whatever blend works yeah whatever blends work yeah so this is actually um pretty much a bordeaux blend this is going to be actually do you want to guess well i was going to tell you i get pyrazine like, uh -huh. uh, so i'm like well, i was already going to say you were right on point yeah because it like, is it's, pyrazine heavy yeah and and that's it so you bordeaux. saw my you saw my face <laughs> that was a good face i was like oh <gasps> i'm a pyrazine freak yeah. um so is Jennifer Beckman. Uh huh. All um, the she she came up um, she came up during my slate mill interview. Uh, she wasn't there, but she her, yeah. she came up because she helped them out. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's still still helping them. Mm -hmm. She's transitioning to something cool. Um, but uh, surely another episode. Yeah. yeah. I, well, Je I need to get Jen on the show at some yeah. point. I mean, it, it's sad we live in the same city, and I, she's never been on my show. She's too much. Fun. But. Um, uh, Anyway, so yeah, I'm like, well, Cab Family, I Cab Soft, Cab Franc, Carmenere, you know, those those are the Did three big ones. Did you just do ones. that? I mean, when we were when That's, we were sm smelling, I'm like, this is well, this has got to be Cab Franc. I mean, this is winner winner chicken dinner. That's the exact blend. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know if no. it was going to have anything like no. like Merlot or no no or Malbec in there. You just but I'm like, you just named this is it all up. this is all this is all like Pyrazinic yeah. grapes. So this is um, yeah. basically like 50% Cab Sauv, okay. 25% Cab Vong, 25% Carmenere. So, way to go, bud. <laughs> this is absolutely right up my alley mm -hmm. as far as, uh, hey, I'm not saying that the other wines I didn't yeah, like. I yeah. loved all these wines, but this was this the, is Bordeaux, Bordeaux, this was Bordeaux. the like, mm -hmm. ooh, wow. And it's not because it's the most expensive, though. You can taste mm -hmm. there's extra love on this wine. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that doesn't mean that, that that's why I like it the best. Um, I've had plenty of wines that I've liked because it was just I liked it, and it wasn't always the most expensive. I mean, I've done it on my episodes where mm -hmm. I've done reviews of multiple wines, and yeah. sometimes the least expensive wine or the middle of the road wine was one I liked it's, the best. It's the favorite. Yeah. yeah. I'm impressed, by the way, that. That this light was the first one to go out because <laughs> I've had troubles with one of those two lights or the batteries, and they've been rock star like they normally are. This Good is the stuff. light that should always go out first. Good deal. Always. Good deal. So I don't know what happened. Anyway, well, no, this wine is awesome. Yeah, it's so super you want to um, since we we're so talking I'll dive expensive. Into two little rabbit holes. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, Capsov is all Brennan Vineyards, so this okay. is where that Texas is going to come into play. So don't fault a wine because it says Texas on it. Right. It doesn't mean it's 25% California. That's a, another huge conversation that is a big rabbit hole I'm not going to go down. I mean, I, I kind of stuck my foot in it, but I'm going to come right back out. Um, well, it doesn't say for sale in Texas only. Yet, correct. Right? It does not say for sale in Texas only or anything like that. But don't fault a wine because it says Texas. Right realize that Texas is gigantic. 
We do not have ABA representation across the state, and that very well could be the ABA that ends up, or the geographic designation that ends up being written on a wine. Doesn't mean anything about its quality. Right. Um, so this is 50% Comanche County. This is going to be cab solved from our vineyards. We do not, um, I say we do not contract any cab from out of here, but we actually do. We have a fantastic new cab grower coming down the pipeline who you will all know about in the next 10 years. Um, some of the most fabulous cab I've ever had in my life is nice. coming from him, um, which takes a lot to say because I love our cab. Um, but this also has Brent Hogue. Uh, he is Blackwater Draw, which is a beautiful draw in the Texas High Plains. Um, he's our Cab Franc supplier. Okay. Um, one of the most fantastic humans I've ever met. Um, I enjoy doing business with him and, um, and he's an innovative grower. He doesn't hear that like, this is how the book says you have to do it and that's what I'm gonna do. He actually is, is innovative and in, in doing things. He's writing his own book, if that cool. makes sense. So love him. And then um, you've got Leahy Vineyards, same location as the Graciano. They are the largest commercial grower of Texas wine grapes. Um, I've heard their name a couple times. I think they have times. like <laughs> 1,300 acres at this point. Oh, wow. It's a, it's, a lot, it's, a lot, it's a lot of wives with a lot of different haircuts at that place. Um, yeah, like every grape is different and requires a different level of care. <laughs> right. And there's a lot of women with a lot of haircuts at that place. I mean, they've got like 30 plus different varieties that they're growing. Wow. So to, to be able to manage that is wholly impressive, but they are our carbon air suppliers um, for this wine. And um, fabulous, fabulous wine, but very bored out. Like this would be a hard one in a blind. So it'd be a hard one. Um, in many ways, I'd mm -hmm. almost put this in Chile. Oh, really? Because, because of the pyrazine, the yeah. high end yeah, of pyrazine, yeah, yeah. because it's really ripe and fruit forward, and it finishes fruit forward. It doesn't finish dry like a Bordeaux, at least not on my on my side. But because the, the pyrazine, and we're talking like bell pepper, that's what pyrazine means. Yeah. The, the bell pepper quality on it is, is so elevated that um, I would associate this with Chile mm -hmm. more than necessarily Bordeaux. Okay. Um, or if it, so if you didn't know, and I know I've talked about this in prior episodes, um, what is surprising is because it's not hard to ripen grapes in Texas, the fact that we have pyrazines is the most surprising part. Mm -hmm. Um, Bordeaux is known for it because Bordeaux is still in this day and age, a marginal climate. Um, though it's, le it's less and less marginal. They have, a, they're having more and more success in ripening things mm -hmm. fully so you don't get that and that's what happens as the grapes ripen up as the grapes ripen the the chemical breakdown or the whatever the the precursors are called that gets you after fermentation to pyrazine is not present because it ripens out in the bordeaux grapes um i, I go back an episode or two you'll hear about that as far as how the grapes are all related um and the story i use for that but yeah i mean that's why I was like, this is a Texas wine. I've got the pyrazines. I've got the bell pepper, um, all that kind of stuff. And that is awesome. But you've mentioned two High Plains places, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's not unusual, I would say, yeah. to because of how the High Plains climate is versus Hill Country. It's, it wouldn't be unusual for me to, yeah. to, to see that. Well, and I'll tell you, our Cabernet is not super heavy in the methoxypyrazines at all. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are going to be years that we get some pyrazines coming through in it, but but really, this is dominant on the Cab Franc and the Carmenere. Yeah, those uh, are the two that have. Yeah. So those are the, so the Cab Franc is the the, mm -hmm. the 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 father of all that. Yes. And that's why the pyrazines are so present, and Carmenere is um, oh, is beautiful. is forgot how it's related to Cabernet Sauvignon. I don't think it's the same parents, parentage, but it's probably Cap Franc is one of the parents. But yeah, it also presents itself up. more than anything yeah. else of other than Cap Franc is the one that it has, has it the most. a Carignan parentage. Maybe. Yeah, but, this is a flashcard that yeah, I, I probably okay. have to study here. Whoops. But of, the, of yeah. the five red, main red Bordelais grapes, um, well, Carmenere was number six because it didn't only really grow it there. Of the six, Carmenere and, and Cabernet Franc are the two that 
both tend to have the most precursors to give you the pyrazines. Those cab Cabernet Sauvignon was, would be next in line, and then after that, it's a little more diluted. And I, I, I can't, one of the one of the grapes is not related, so it doesn't really ever happen. Right. I think right, it's Malbec right. because Malbec came from somewhere else Correct. and got it, it got imported into Bordeaux Correct. by somebody named Malbec or something like that. Something like that. There's there's yeah. a reason why there's a name for it. Yeah, it's like sure. called Cot or whatever somewhere else or fair or i can't remember another flash card that i need to yeah. study oh, well. but no this is a delicious uh -huh. wine yeah. well, um, but, but it, good value. they're good values yeah. i mean they're good prices for mm -hmm. what they are and and yeah. not crazy yeah um like if you had told me this was 80 bucks i would believe you yeah because it's i, I mean it's i got think that, for the quality you're maybe, getting you're getting a lot of bang if these butt. were if these were like anywhere from that 10 to 20 ish mm -hmm. 30 dollar more yeah i would be like okay well, and that brings us to a really good point. Um, if you follow us on social media or anything like that, you'll see um, a big communication of us trying to humanize wine for Texans. Mm -hmm. um, like we mentioned earlier, wine was, you know, we're in sweet tea and Dr. Pepper country. And so the fact that we have people drinking Graciano and Reserve Cabs and, and this beautiful winemaker's choice is crazy. Um, but we really try to humanize wine for Texans because we want it to be approachable. Yeah. Um, and so we do a huge, huge marketing campaign around life pairings, not necessarily food pairings, mm -hmm. but life pairings. So okay. you'll, if you ever go look at Brendan Pairs with Life, like you'll see, we've got farmers in the area that are drinking dry rosé while fishing at their tanks. Um, and so we try to really have that conversation of like, wine is not a pinky in the air right. thing, right? Like this is, this is grape growing. This is vineyards. This is farming. Like, yeah, you're growing sorghum and cotton across the street and we're growing grapes across the street, but we are all farming. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that is a, a big conversation that we, uh, want to have with our consumers is that, you know, it's, it's not fancy. It is. It can be. It can you want to totally make fancy. it fancy? Yeah. Do it. But like, this is Pat Brennan and Travis Conley down the street, and this is what their hands look like. And this is farming. Like, this is native to Texas. We are farmers. Yeah. We have rural America, and um, so we're we're really striving really hard to make that communication for the consumer because you know, Lone Star, like. You know. Yeah. Well, I think I think in in many ways because the way the United States wine industry has mm -hmm. has evolved is that we don't view it as farming because we didn't have that at least on the on the winemaking right. side that history of hundreds of years right. and it's not a part of our culture that wines mm -hmm. at every meal right. that you that you have a you have a set of grapes in your mm -hmm. backyard yeah. that you that you farm yourself and you make wine out of like they mm -hmm. do in lots of european countries right so you go to europe and i mean wines at every table it's i mean mm -hmm. maybe it's not a 45 five dollar bottle of Breakfast wine but wine, it's the best wine but but it's yeah. the best but it's but it's gonna be one of the yeah. best wines you've ever had because a lot of this is mm -hmm. environment but um, you know, I can guarantee you, if I took any of these wines home, I like all the wines. I'm still going to like them again. It's not necessarily that I'm like, remember my, my time here with right. Rebecca or I have a, I have a soft spot in my heart already for Brendan Vineyards. But if I'm in a, my home environment in a controlled environment, these, these wines will travel well and that the experience I have here is still mm -hmm. going to, it's not going to, it's not going to be like, oh, the wine was so great at the winery. Yeah. And then I take it home. It's like, oh, it's not that good. I've had it happen. Mm -hmm. I've had it happen with wineries, with wines. I mean, I've also had it happen where I've done a review. Where you got and the I've been, smoke and mirror show. <laughs> yeah, I've had it where I've had a review at home and I've been maybe super critical of the wine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, really, it's not that great or it's not my style. And then and then a month, I've, I corv and everything. Yeah. So maybe a week later, a month later, two months later, I tried the wine again. I was like, oh, wow, this wine is actually pretty good. This you know, good or time. I've had the opposite. I've had this wine is awesome. It's like, oh, it's not really, wasn't as good as last time. Mm -hmm. And like you've already alluded to, yeah. these things are living things. It could have been in a weird mm -hmm. phase. It could have been in a great phase. Yeah. You know, these, these wines go through awkward phases and they go through yeah. awesome phases. And you, I could have just hit it the right time mm -hmm. and the wrong time. Yeah. But, Well, yeah. It's, it's a big conversation that we want to have with consumers. And, um, and really, as industry folk, I hope that we all have with consumers. is like wine is, you know, people talk about like beer or spirits or, or whatever as, as it's some big fancy thing and I'm like, y'all, this is like water, sweet tea and 
wine for me. Like mm -hmm. wine's, it's just a beverage that goes on my table. Yeah. I don't put it on a pillar. I, I do choose like based on what we're eating and, and that's just me because I'm a food person. It drives yeah. my husband nuts. He's like, I've never met somebody that wants to think about what they're eating at what time of day so much. And I'm like, well, that's what I enjoy. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, like I just want to know. And and I enjoy and take pleasure in those things. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's my personal thing. But, you know, wine... It's nothing fancy. We don't have to have a pinky in the air about it. Like Not at all. It, it was ground down the road. It came here. It got pressed and we made wine from it. Mm -hmm. It's super simple. Yeah. It's a beverage that you get to drink from your community. And, and that speaks to the whole local board movement and, and really what wine should be. Yeah. So um, on that note, that's probably a great note to close out on. Yeah, exactly. Vineyards, but. So, um, I, I just I want to thank Rebecca for mm. spending a lot of time with me. Harvest is over, so it's a lot easier for Ooh, for yeah. people to be able to to Dude. hang out with me for yeah. two hours because yeah. we're because I ran you way over on your time. Hey, I, again, I'm I have nothing going on. <laughs> um, but we tasted seven wines in two hours. And yeah, that's impressive. That, that's impressive. Yeah, um, and I just just want to mention. Um, so this is the last of the of the trip, and everyone's been wonderful. Um, you know. Uh, there's lots of protocols that all these wineries have had mm -hmm. to take in, take in consideration, yeah. whether they're serving food or not, and having to be considered a restaurant. Um, it didn't really get kind of Oof. brought up in the other in, in interviews, and we're not going to go down that rabbit hole too far. Yeah. But it, because of what's going on, um, you know, wineries have had to really do a lot of adjustments. I think I think Julie mentioned it in her interview mm -hmm. because they they're it's renting hard. food trucks for Pedernales yeah. to really get that extra bit Which of food. Which is a thing. new wonderful thing. Uh, we have a commercial kitchen here, so yeah. we're good. But um, it's it's been a tough go of it for yeah. Texas wines and and breweries and distilleries also. Everybody, like, yeah, it's not just us. And and bars have had the worst of it. The bars, you know, yeah. and it's just it, you know. For a lot of industries, it's easy to make that adaptation to have your social distancing or work from home, but Todd can't really work from home. No. <laughs> like, yeah. no, you know, he, it's, he can't home. be a winemaker and work from home. Um, you can't be somebody working in the tasting room and work from home, you know, and so the fact that you're able to still It's agriculture do that. at the end of the day. Like, yeah. It's an essential business. Like, it is. It's a perishable crop that's got to come off and it's got to be taken care of. So It, it does. So, um this has been a wonderful trip. Um, I mean, just to kind of I, to to talk about, Rebecca used basically, literally 100 percent. Or was well, I guess I guess it's technically uh, 95 percent. 96 percent. 96 percent alcohol. Not not isopropyl like yeah, it was actually no. Everclear, right? Everclear. Yeah. 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 So to and to sanitize the glasses for me, mm -hmm. you know, and I know all the other wineries are doing some type of way to sanitize yeah. glasses, but we normally polish with beautiful cloths. Yeah. Beautiful, really expensive cloths, which you yeah. guys all know. Um, and today, everything got polished with uh, Everclear and paper towels, disposable, yeah. and because um, that's what needs to happen right now. Yeah. You know. So. But yeah, so thank you so much. Yeah. Um, thank you, you for know. coming. Uh, yeah. Not everybody comes to Comanche, so thank She's you so much. She's been bugging me for years. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, yeah, it's like three hours away. Over <laughs> over several beers at Texom, yeah. because that's what you got to do at Texom is drink and a different beverage. Basically, what, it made it easy because I went to Spicewood yesterday, and I was about halfway here anyway. Yeah. And I'll, figure, I'll just I'll just make the trip Unless up here. Unless you live in Houston, we are two hours from anywhere. That's the truth of it. We're about it's two hours from Austin. Three. For two and me. a half. Three. <laughs> okay, so it depends on how heavy your right foot is. But and two and where a half in San hours, Antonio yeah. I live, because everyone in, in the hill country is like, well, we're like an half hour, hour away. I'm like, yeah. you are an hour and a half from where I live. Yeah. Because I live in the country. Not really. I live in the county. Well, it is nice on to the be east. central. I so. live on the the east side of yeah. San Antonio, almost actually, I, I don't even live in the city of San Antonio, but you know, where I live, it is, you know, the Eastern part of, of the County of the city. Mm -hmm. So I still have to go through the entire city yeah. to that get, traffic. then, then That's get like, to, yeah. we just were in the Metroplex, um, daughters in the NICU at uh, children's and it was like, well, would you rather be in Fort Worth or would you rather go to Arlington or would you rather go to Dallas for your follow up? And we're like, as Fort close Worth? to us as we could be, <laughs> yeah. please. It'd be the equivalent yeah. of coming from Dallas yeah. to here. Yeah. Um, it adds an extra hour. <laughs> yeah, it does. So that that's that's the way it's like for me with San Antonio. Yeah. All right. Cool. So yeah, we're gonna wrap things up. Um, 
everyone, you know, this has been a great trip. Um, I hope to make more trips over the next few months, if not at least, you know, early next year. Mm -hmm. uh, luckily with Texas, the weather isn't usually terrible, at least not into the hill country. Yeah, no, but it is September and we are wearing coats. Yeah, weird. so um, I definitely encourage you if you are in Texas and to, we have lots of awesome wineries in our backyards to please head over to your closest winery and give them some support, yeah. buy them in your grocery store, your wine shop, your restaurant, especially now that restaurants can, can do wine to go. Yeah. Um, so definitely take They're advantage of that. Gifts. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're not in Texas and you're nearby and you're going to make a trip over here, Hey, come out here, yeah. you know, Hey, the Hill Country's awesome and, and all that, but yeah, come and out here. check our websites. Some of us ship across the nation. Yeah. So yeah. A lot of places in Texas we ship will ship 38 out. states. Yeah. We'll ship so. out to other states and we're finally getting to that time of year where it's a lot safer to ship. Oh and a lot cheaper to ship. Thank goodness. So you don't have to yeah. have overnights and ice packs mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah, exactly. We're glad for that. We did a lot of that this year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. so yeah. Um, other than that, hope you're enjoying the format here and we'll see everyone again next yeah. time. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.